Okay, so yeah, we had the technical issue uh, because us a bit late, about 10 minutes. At, at least then we solve it. Share the slides. Okay. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So today we will continue with the uh, read mapping problem, which is one of the most commonly used in uh, almost all bioinformatics analyses. This is a very important step. And the normally bioinformaticians deal with this step on daily basis, especially if they are doing a lot of uh, sample sequencing at the wit lab. Uh, for today, we'll continue with two filters. Uh, last week, we explained about Gatekeeper, which is one of the pre-alignment filters used to uh, filter out the data before going to the expansive algorithm, which is sequence alignment. For today, we'll continue with Magnet and Shuji, which are two filters proposed by the group. And um, th this is as a reminder, you can still access all the slides, everything, all the schedule online using this link down below in the footer. Uh, we normally publish the slides before the lecture, so you can access them this morning, for example. You can see the videos and everything. All right. So um, as a summary of the last lecture, we said that we need intelligent algorithms and intelligent hardware or architectures that both can handle the data very well. So uh, we agree, all of us, hopefully, that designing algorithms alone is not efficient. Designing hardware architecture for existing algorithm might not be efficient. The best way to deal with it or to get the most speed up is to design an algorithm that is aware about the hardware you are using. And we motivate this, or we already proved this, by showing the need for why we use Vertex 7 family, for example, for Gatekeeper. And we already show the details about picking the right algorithm for the right hardware and vice versa. So we pick an a vertex, vertex 7 board that has a lookup table or number of input for the lookup table that can fit well the design we have or the architecture we built uh, for Gatekeeper, for example. And this is from the previous slide, previous lecture as well. So we agree, all of us, that sequence alignment is expensive. And our goal is not to avoid this expensive algorithm because simply we cannot. This is fundamentally the most accurate algorithm that can tell us uh, the exact location of the edit operation that need to happen so that both sequences are similar. And also it can give us the uh, exact type of this location and the optimal number of these uh, operations. And our goal is to accelerate still, to accelerate read mapping, but not to replace the sequence alignment, but rather to reduce the workload need to be examined by the sequence alignment step. And this is again from the previous lectures, just to refresh up, to remind you about the two types of sequence alignment or genomic sequences. So we said they are either similar or dissimilar. And the similarity here is based on the threshold. So we set the threshold based on the user need or based on the application. For example, if you are studying SNPs, you are looking for probably for single SNP or at most three SNPs, three variations at certain locations. So uh, these, um, these application normally uh, impose an, an threshold on the number of uh, uh, differences between the sequences so that you can say these are similar or dissimilar. And if they are dissimilar, Normally we don't care about them. We don't need them. So we do some calculation until we figure out that they are dissimilar and then we trash them. Why is that? Because simply they, the number of differences between these pairs exceed already the threshold and probably they don't have any significant meaning for that disease that we are studying. However, if they are similar, again, it's based on a threshold and this threshold is variable, right? A user configurable. So you can change it from five to six to eight, whatever value you want to choose. But on pra in practice, we choose this value to be 5% of the read length. And so uh, if we are using Illumina data, which is normally 100 long uh, sequences, so we use up to five differences. But if we are use ONT, for example, we can uh, increase the threshold to 15% of the read length because the error, uh, the sequencing error is very high over there. And again, depends on the application. So there are a lot of studies showing the right number to be picked over there, or you can have it as very large, and then you decide after you produce the output of read mapping. However, if they are similar, 
then they are beneficial to us. Then we are interested in finding more results about these similar sequences. For example, as I mentioned, the location of these differences, the number of the differences, and the type. So there are different types for the differences, for example, insertions, deletions, substitutions, and so on. So these are very important types because, uh, again, they, uh, they lead to some certain disease, especially if you have um, uh, this operation happening at certain location that you already have a historical record that these locations or alteration in this location might cause a problem. If they are dissimilar strings, doesn't make sense to use very expensive algorithm to tell us that the number of differences here exceeding a threshold and then you trash all the computation because you already have wasted cycles to calculate this so for us we always try to propose a filters that can tell us quickly if the number of differences between two pair of sequences uh, exceeding a threshold or below a threshold of course below or equal to that threshold now, the exact number we figured out using our filter, uh, we don't really need it to be uh, the exact value that we would get using sequence alignment or optimal algorithm. For example, if our threshold is five and the filter set is nine, the number of differences is nine, then it doesn't matter if this nine is really true or false, as long as it's always above the threshold using also the optimal algorithm. Again, if the threshold is five, the optimal algorithm said the number of differences is seven and our filter says is nine, then it's fine. As long as both of them, the optimal algorithm and the filter agree that uh, the number of differences exceed the threshold, then it's perfectly fine. Likewise, when the number of differences are equal or less than the threshold. We don't care about the exact value at this stage. We care only to answer one question whether the number of differences exceed a threshold or they are still equal or less than a threshold. And that is the main idea for all the filters that we presented so far. Uh, so we change read mapping in a way that uh, after you specify or you find the match or the seed hits using the hash table or the index you, uh, you uh, favor, then we add the pre-alignment filter. So the pre-alignment filter will take two sequences or can operate over the seeds themselves and try to figure out whether this location that you uh, detect in the reference genome might lead to a good mapping or a good alignment or not. And again, how we define good is based on the threshold. If the threshold is set to be five, then we want something or locations that have five or less errors. Of course, the less the least is the better. And after using the pre-alignment filter, we will still use the sequence alignment. Uh, this is again from the previous lecture, just to refresh uh, the things in mind, we need really three requirements. First, uh, filter out most of the dissimilar sequences. Again, why we said most of, not all, just because we cannot do optimal algorithm here, right? We are not aiming for optimality, but we are aiming for accuracy and speed up. The second thing is to preserve all similar sequences. And here it must be all, because if you start reducing or you start um, uh, uh, rejecting the correct or similar sequences, then you are in a problem because you are going to lose some of the correct locations. Now, whether this location that you lose will going to lead to lose some of the variation or structure variation or variant polling, that is another question. We don't know whether a single location might affect uh, the variant calling step or not, which is coming right after read mapping. Um, but normally read mapping lose some, some of the location on the way. So uh, including Minimap2, for example, none of the tools do a perfect job uh, the, some, of, some of the tools for read mapping try to focus on certain cases, certain application, for example, large deletions, large insertions, and so on. They cannot give you the full alignment results or the full uh, or the correct uh, read mapping results as if you do brute force uh, uh, algorithm where you can map to every location and then you examine the one with the better uh, alignment score or the least at a distance, for example. And the main idea here is to do it quickly. 
why we need it quickly because this is the goal to reduce the overall execution time of read mapping okay so let's go quickly over magnet uh, in magnet we try to analyze the accuracy of gatekeeper and we focus on false positives what are false positive or what do we mean by false positive false positives are the things that we falsely accept so they are dissimilar but the filter says that these are similar sequences. So we are falsely accepting them, passing them to the sequence alignment. And the, the, the least we have false positives, the better because we are going to reduce the workload for the sequence alignment. And since they are false positives, so they are incorrect anyway, they are dissimilar. The number of differences already exceed the threshold. And we figure out five sources, five main sources of false positive or false accept rate in gatekeeper. And we call them leading and trailing zeros. This is the first source. The second source, random zeros. Third source, conservative counting. And then the fourth source is lack of back tra tracking. So the first source is where you uh, have the leading and trailing zeros. And these are extra zeros. These are added by ourselves, not by the sequences themselves. What is the cause for these uh, leading and trailing zeros? If you remember from the previous lecture, we said we shift one of the sequences either to the right or to the left by gradual steps, one step, then two steps, then three steps. And each time we shift, we do the XOR with the other sequence. So for example, we uh, shift the query, we shift the query by one step to the right and then do the XOR. Now, once we do the shift, the first, the first character in the query sequence will be shifted to the second location. And once it's shifted, then the first character from the reference has no corresponding location in the first sequence. So when you want to do the XOR, you cannot do it with that character because what we call a vacant bit uh, because of the shifting process. And um, uh, for, for us, we consider these as zeros. You could consider them as one, it's up to you, but we consider them as zeros uh, especially uh, these, um, uh, not all of them, uh, only the deletion mask over here and those. So this is one zero, single zeros, and then three zeros. The fourth zero or the fourth and five are result of something else, not because of the shift operation, because the, the last mask we shift three times only. Remember that. So now what's, what's wrong with these zeros? These zeros will dominate always and you cannot replace them. Uh, if you remember, we did um, uh, a heuristic or a work around where we replace a single zero or two zeros, but they need to be wrapped up by ones. So it should be one, then single zero, then another one so that we can replace that single zero uh, into one. And then we will not have any domination when we do the AND operation. So now these zeros will always dominate. So with whatever you have one, even if it is correct, even if you have an edit operation, you will always going to ignore, ignore these. And this is an example. So think about uh, here, the third character over there is edit operation, but we never get it in the results. As you can see here, all are zeros. So uh, that is one of the codes for the false positive. Now, whether this is important, significant or not, it really depends on the data. Uh, because uh, not always you will have edit operation around the leading and trailing characters. You may have the edit operation somewhere in the middle, then these zero won't affect anything. So it really depends on the data, but uh, there might be significant. All right. So the second source of false positive is what we call random zeros. What are the random zeros? Are the things that we replace. So these bit vectors after we replace single zero and two zeros. Now, how about three zeros, four zeros, five zeros, and so on? What is the right number to be chosen here? We don't know, right? Uh, it's just a heuristic. We try and uh, it seems to be working fine with single zero, two zeros, but um, how about three zeros, four zeros, and so on? Um, these are always causing some domination. So always cancel any one vertically happening to appear in the same location of these random zeros. So there is no solution except uh, trying to replace these with ones. 
but then the false uh, positive might not be solved because you solve this source of random zeros, but you might cause another source of false positive because you're trying now to uh, overestimate the number of ones or underestimate. It really need to be uh, examined carefully. Uh, but uh, again, it will also cause to increase the computation, because if you remember, we choose five input lookup table operation to replace single zero or two zeros. Now, if you want to replace five zeros, you need to pay more cost for that. And then you will pay more resources and might lead to have a longer critical path, which will affect the execution time on FPJs, for example. Okay. I'm trying to get the cursor. Now the third source is conservative counting. So this is, we didn't explain it in the previous lecture, but um, this is in, in, in a summary that once you replace single zero or two zeros into ones, now at the end, in the very final that vector that you get it as a result of hand operation, uh, you need to do some conservative counting. What do we mean by conservative counting? We need to guess whether any three ones or four ones, if they are coming from amendment of zeros into ones, or they are actually coming from um, a large set of deletions or insertion, for example. So you got a group of deletions, like four deletions next to each other. Then those will get as a four ones in the, bet, in the final bet factor. So conservatively, we assume that any three ones or four ones, they are always coming from the process we did, changing the zeros into ones. So that now we, uh, these three ones, for example, will be interpreted into only two ones. These three ones over there, since they are three or four, we said, okay, what if it was one, zero, one, and we change the, the zero over there into one so that we got one, one, one then we should count these three ones as two edit and not three edit because there is something in the middle that we did ourselves. If we change it back into two, why we do the replacement in the first place? Think about it. Why we did the change if we still count them as two at the end? So yeah, we try to uh, to not dominate the z the ones. So if there was a zero somewhere, we'll always uh, we get one answer. Let me switch the cursor. It's very difficult to see because it won't show in the final mask without amendment. Yes, excellent, perfect, exactly. So if we don't do the change, it will always dominate. The, the zeros in the middle and to never show that there was a one over there or a zero. But still, uh, sometimes we are replacing uh, a correct one, right? So it, it might not be a result of amendment. So that change happening over there might not be zero, might be one uh, in fact, right? So here we are trying to do underestimation. Sorry. We try to do underestimation Underestimation is always good for us because overestimation will lead to falsely reject the correct sequences. So always uh, underestimating, for example, if the right number is four and we said there are three edits, that's fine because it lead to be accepted, especially if the three is still equal or less than the threshold. But if we overestimate, if the number of edits are four and we said there are five, as long as five, is uh, or both of them agree that is higher than the threshold, then it's fine. It's not false reject, it's not false accept. But if one of them disagree, especially our filter, disagree with the um, correct or the optimal algorithm compared to the threshold, then we will have a problem. Hopefully this is clear. All right, and the fourth source is lack of backtrack, uh, backtracking. So what is backtracking? We said last time, if you observe, the number of ones in the final bit vector are always indication of the location of these edit operation. So uh, whenever we got a one, let me change the color to blue. But whenever we got a one, for example, here, 
It means there are something happening at these two locations. And it's true. You can see here, there are two ones causing the exact matches to move from the Hamming distance or the Hamming mass all the way to one deletion mask. Normally, if there are a switch or change from one mask to another mask, it means either there are insertion or deletion. Cannot be substitution. If substitution, it will remain in the Hamming mask because Hamming mask, we said, it's perfect for substitutions. Now, uh, since we moved to one deletion mask, it means it was happening at deletion over there. And you can see it from the character and the corresponding location. Uh, you can see really uh, there is a deleted uh, C over there and then another substitution. Or you can, can consider the T as substitution and then delete the C. That's why you can consider the one happening in the Hamming mask and the other one happening at the one deletion mask. Now at the other uh, location, uh, the yellow highlighted portion here, since we go back to Hamming mask, what happened? Uh, think about it. Now, if we move from Hamming mask to one deletion mask, it means deletion. But if we go back to Hamming mask again, what could be the operation over there? So if we get another deletion, it will move to directly to two deletion mask. If we get another deletion after some location, then we will move the exact matches or the green segment into three deletion masks and so on. But to go in the opposite direction, going up, it always should be caused by insertion. So if we move from three deletion mask into two deletion mask, it means we got one insertion and so on. As long as we keep getting insertions, then we will keep moving until Hamming mask. Then after that, you cannot detect it. You will not see the green highlighted segment anywhere if you exceed three operation consecutively. We got an answer in the chat box. Insertions, yes, perfect, Nadia. Uh, let me delete the annotation. Okay. Yeah, so lack of backtracking uh, tracking always uh, can cause a problem. Why is that? Because think about the things in yellow, highlighted in yellow, there is no ones over there, right? So once we do the AND operation, it sounds like a single segment in the final bit vector. And it sounds like we don't have any edit operation happening over there. Now, if we backtrace these green segments, if we really check which mask uh, having those uh, green segments, then we can have an idea similar to the things I was explaining. So if we move from one mask to another, then there is a deletion. If we move from here to there, then should be insertion, even if we don't get one. Even if there is no one over there, we still, we know that is insertion since the segment now appears uh, on the uh, Hamming mask. So that can be a solution for this, for example. Now, Given the analysis we did in magnet paper, we propose a, a new algorithm. Um, now the key observation that correct alignment always include non-overlapping long identical subsequences and those based on the matrix we built. So you need to build all these masks and then you try to find the green highlighted segments. And then you will see that always they are non-overlapping. Even if they are overlap at some point, for example, I don't see any of them overlap but they might overlap and this overlap portion is not part of the solution. So the solution should always include the non-overlapping portions. So you might get um, this, let me choose green. You might get this portion as zeros. So then it will overlap with this portion over here. But then when you calculate the final answer, um, you will consider the segment until here. The green segment will be until here, and the rest will be coming from the other segment, or vice versa. You can consider this segment uh, up to here, for example, and then the rest will come from the other segment. Just put, keep it in mind that always they should be non-overlapping in the final result. All right. Now the key idea in magnet is to count the consecutive zeros in each mask and select the longest in a divide and conquer approach. 
So instead of doing and operation, we don't do it here. We just calculate the mask as if we do it in, in a, a gatekeeper. And then we um, try to count the largest number of consecutive zeros in each mask. And we greedily choose the one with the largest number out, the, uh, out of these. And then we divide and concur the problem to smaller subproblems and try to solve each subproblem separately. Let's see an example for that. Here are two sequences. Um, we try to solve all the sources we identify for false positive one by one. For example, the first leading and trailing zeros, we solve it by not having zero, but rather having ones. So you can see these dashes in the beginning and dashes at the end over there. These are ones uh, normally. And now, um, uh, remember here, um, when we explained the algorithm, we explained the main diagonal or the Hamming mask in the middle rather than being the first one. Uh, so we don't do here as what we do in Gatekeeper. For example, we check the Hamming mask first. If the number of uh, edit operation are less than threshold, then you terminate the algorithm. We don't do it here because here we rely on divide and concur, which will make uh, a lot of sub problems that will be solved in parallel. So still much faster than what we have in Gatekeeper and more accurate. Why accurate? Because we solve all these four sources of false positives. Now, how to operate. So as I said, we go over each mask. We count the number of zeros that are next to each other, that are consecutive to each other. And then we try to find uh, the segment that has the largest number of zeros out of all masks, which is coming from upper diagonal two, which is the one highlighted as number one over there. Once we find that this is the largest number of zeros, we move this number of zeros, or we move the entire segment to the final results, or what we call magnet bit factor, as you can see here. So first we got uh, this segment, highlight. We first get this segment in the results. The rest is still not calculated. We don't have these yet. And now we cancel the entire area. Now how you cancel it in a real implementation? For us, we change everything into ones. So you'll never calculate it again. But for you, you could just simply um, divide the indices or have an indices where it can tell you where to check next. So, you, so that you exclude the entire area from the next iteration. Otherwise, you will go into infinite loop because you will keep getting this long segment as the largest segment of zeros. Now what we do, we add ones to the right and left, regardless if they are there or not. Why is that? So you can see the ones even added to the final bit vector. Over here, uh, oops and drawings so over here you can see there's one and over there so there's one to the right and one to the left this happening after detecting any segment of zeros whenever we detect one segment of zeros directly wrap it or encapsulate it with ones from the right and one from the left that is an indication that this segment was alone was separated from the other segments otherwise if it is not separated, then we would get a very long segments of zeros. So you won't get a limited length as in here, but rather to be extended until the end if there is no edit operation over here. So we add these ones in purpose as an indication of edit operation. Think about the, uh, the example we show the last, which is lack of backtracking, uh, where you don't have ones between the two uh, segments of zeros, right? Uh, because they overlap and there's no one between them. Now this is going to solve that issue. So when, whenever you split two segments by ones, then it, this is for sure an indication of edit operation to the right and left, which is the right thing to do. Uh, now let's move. So we add the ones here. Now iterate again, exactly and the same algorithm. This won't change. So we, you, return, you go and uh, count the number of zeros in each mask and then get the one with the largest number of zeros. Now you could do this in divide and concur or you could do it iteratively. So divide and concur would consider the right side uh, problem as separate problem and the left-hand side as another problem. So you need to solve each using the same algorithm but in parallel because they are independent of each other. But if you want to do it iteratively, 
you may want to consider the second problem first over the here in the right and the left hand uh, side and then you move to the right hand side try to solve that problem so here we choose divide and conquer because it's uh, very efficient and you don't need to wait uh, for each sub problem since they are independent then you can use multi threading uh, to solve each separately so you find that these regions contain the largest number of zeros, and then you move them over there. You don't care where they are coming from, which mask they result these, uh, or they generate these zeros, but you care about the number. So you get the number of zeros first, and then you wrap it by ones. For example, the one, the left-hand side doesn't have a space at the left side over here. So you cannot add one. You cannot exceed the width of the read length. Over here, we don't add one, but we add the one over here, right? Likewise, with the right-hand side, we don't have a space over here. There is no more locations to add anything. So we add the one only to the left side. Now we keep iterating to the very last uh, two sub-problems, and then we add ones at the corresponding location in the final bit vector. And this is how we got the solution by just counting the number of ones. Apparently, you can see that we solved the four sources of false positive. Now, the only source remains over there is um, kind of backtracking, but not the same problem that we explained. Because here, we still don't have any information about where the error coming from. So if one, someone interested in improving this algorithm, he might uh, think about a way where to uh, add extra information about uh, the source or the index of each of these segments, where each segment is generated from, which mask. And each mask has a meaning. If anything appears in one deletion mask, means there was a deletion before this segment. If it moves again into two deletion masks, it means there, are, there is a, another deletion happening after that segment, and so on. All right, hopefully the algorithm was clear. Now, um, how many times we iterate? How many times we need to divide and go um, over uh, many sub problems? Because each time we divide the problem, we generate two sub problems if they are available, one to the right side and one to the left side. So we have in the paper a nice proof of this. Uh, I think we include it in Shuji paper about magnet because we do analysis for magnet and in Shuji paper and supplementary material. So I recommend everyone to go over there, check the analysis and the proof for the correctness and optimality of this filtering and by not filtering any, uh, um, any correct or similar sequences. And we solve it using a tree, uh, tree structure because the root can be thought as the entire problem and then the leaves or the, the sampling in the tree has um, the, the each sub problem resulted from dividing this uh, very huge problem into smaller sub problems. So now what is the height of the tree? Based on this observation. So we observe that whenever we have one edit operation, then we divide the matches into two segments. Or when we have two edit operations, then we divide the matches into three segments. And likewise. So based on this observation, we said, okay, it seems that the number of segments or the number of sub-problems that we are going to have is related to the edit distance threshold. So it's always E plus one or the number of edits plus one. That is the maximum number of sub-problems generated uh, by having edit operation in the uh, any of the two sequences. All right, so we implement this on, uh, on FPGAs, and these are the resources needed. Uh, to count here, uh, either you can consider the entire mask to do the counting, or you can divide the problem into, for example, two sub problems, and then you, you solve each, uh, each of these problems separately using magnet uh, algorithm. So we use counter and then comparator to compare the maximum number of zeros. And then you get these indices or the information about the number of zeros into the final bit factor. And then you wrap it by ones. And then you find a way to isolate this region from the next iteration. And then you try to solve again and again. And we could have also parallelism over there by having multiple module to solve this problem in parallel. 
Uh, the Verilog code is available online. You can go to Magnet uh, repo on GitHub, uh, or you can check it from the paper, and you will see a uh, CPU code plus the Verilog code over there. So you can check and see, play with it, and maybe get a better algorithm out of it. The results we got is really significant, especially the accuracy. Uh, so um, we got about 3.5x all the way to four orders of magnitude, four to five orders of magnitude, more accurate than Gatekeeper. And remember, Gatekeeper um, uh, tried to do a simple algorithm, just do an AND operation. There's no complexity over there. But here, we increase the computation, and that's going to reduce the execution time. But now, which one is better? A filter with high ratio of false positive, but it's slow or fast. And another one with low false positive, but it's uh, slow. So either you get slow and less uh, and more accuracy or fast and um, uh, less accuracy. So apparently there's trade-off between the speed and the accuracy. So you want something fast, but can generate more workload for the sequence alignment or you want something slow, but can generate less workload for sequence alignment. Apparently we cannot answer that question easily because we really need to have the sequence aligner at the, at the next step, and then uh, evaluate both of them together in the same setup. So we have filter and sequence alignment, and then we can get uh, more uh, insight about the speed up or the overall speed up we can get out of this. Why is that? Because again, if the filter generating more sequences, the sequence alignment is going to take more time. And then we lose any speed up we got out of the filter because we have a lot of false positive. So we really need to integrate this with the sequence aligner. And then we evaluate both of them together and see uh, the speed up, the overall speed up we got out of this. As I said, the, the code is already available online. Feel free to play with it, test it. All right, so can we do better? Can How about the scalability? So apparently you need to count the number of zeros in the entire mask. So if the mask is 1 million long, then it will take you very long time to count this number of zeros. Plus the resources will be huge and you might not be able to synthesize such design. You really need to have a specific size of the counter, how many bits you want to count, right? And uh, what is the iteration over uh, all this mask? So do you want to count uh, the number of zeros within every 100 bits, for example? So you need, you need to make choice uh, out uh, of the design so that you can make it scalable for any read length. In that time, when we built Magnet, we didn't have long reads. It was not exist uh, in, uh, it did not exist when we started Magnet project. So ONT was um, having, uh, 65 all the way to 80 percent of accuracy so there were a lot of errors over there and nobody was using them in around 2016 2017 but once we start seeing long reads then that was a huge motivation for us to go for scalability what if the sequence length now getting uh, longer that is shuji so in shuji we said, okay, there's still the correct answer include long identical subsequences and they are non-overlapping, right? But we need, uh, we also observe that processing the entire mapping at once as in gatekeeper is ineffective for hardware design. So think about, it, this also include magnet, right? If you consider the entire mask as one, uh, one uh, sequence or one register and you want to do any operation with it, can be really long uh, register. So including a bitwise operation over this register, always expensive. We said, uh, this is another observation uh, based on the dot plot, which is a very old um, visualization for similarity between sequences. It was proposed in 1985. It says, whenever you have matches between two characters, just add a dot in this uh, table. So you can see these stars representing the dots uh, for example, when we have a T and T, you have a dot over there, T and T, a dot, and so on. G and G, it's also dots. So now where's the right solution? The right solution is somewhere around the diagonal. And this is what we got from optimal algorithm, that these is, this is the right answer. So what we observe, 
or the key idea is that we said rather than going and calculating these uh, dots or zeros, why not just having uh, a limited search space? And we want to see if we are moving between the segments or not. Our goal is not to count how many zeros over there, but our goal is to detect when we move from one segment to another. For example, this area. Now, it's totally the opposite as we do in Magnet and Gatekeeper. In Magnet and Gatekeeper, we always try to count these zeros, right? But we find out these zeros might be the longest. So always we have few errors, for example, few Xs, and then you have very long number of zeros in between, as in here, for example. So if you try to count these zeros, you will always suffer when you try to implement it in hardware. But if you try to count these from the first place, then that will be more efficient plus scalable because these are normally short segments over here. And this is what we do here. We try to have a sliding window going over these diagonals. And whenever we see a switch between one uh, mask to another mask, we said there, there is some edit operation happening, happening there. And then we count only the ones happening between the two segments rather than counting the number of zeros over there. Hopefully the idea is clear. So now let's move to the next slide where we have the key idea, use overlapping sliding window approach to quickly and accurately find all long segments of consecutive zeros. Now we build the matrix. It's a bit different from what we have in Gatekeeper and Magnet. Uh, let's go to the example right away. So th this is a visualization of it. And as you can see, we ignore the leading and trailing. We don't have them anymore. So uh, if you count the number of cells in this diagonal, you will see it is longer than or larger than the number of cells in this diagonal, for example. Why is that? Because here you have one missing and also here to make uh, this diagonal equal to this uh, to the length of this diagonal. So here we do, in this structure or this visualization, we really don't deal with the leading and trailing zeros. We don't replace them as ones or zero. They do not exist at all. Okay, so let me delete the visualization. Yeah, feel free to stop me for any question. Now let's go through the algorithm. We choose a search window of size four. So the width of the search window is four cells. As you can see here, we always can detect any four cells in any of the diagonals. And we count the number of zeros. And um, the number of zeros here and not necessarily to be consecutive. So we count how many zeros over there and we find there are four zeros. Now, of course, the, the more, the better. Now, remember, even if we count the zeros here, our goal is not to count them. Our goal is just to see whether we are in the same diagonal or we switch between the uh, search window into another diagonal, as we will see over here in this region. Now we store the four here and we move on because this is overlapping sliding window. So the size of the window is still four and we count the number of uh, zeros um, in each diagonal. So here we got three zeros. So this is the largest move. Now, when we move, this is where the part uh, that maybe give you a clear idea about where we detect the, the ties or breaking the ties between two segments. Now, when we want to move the results or these zeros into the final bit vector, what happens? What's happening now is that there are overlapping by how many? By three cells. So each result will overlap with the previous result by three cells. Why is that? Because we move the search window by single step each time. Now, which one to keep, which one to remove? Here, apparently it's clear because the first bets are similar to the previous results. In both cases are three zeros. So it's okay to overlap them, as you can see, right? Yeah, I repeated maybe a thousand times. Now there's one more. Now the, the trick or how to break the ties here is to pick the one that will maximize the number of zeros. 
that is always to underestimate better than overestimate the number of ones. So we choose the, the segment that's going to overtake this location, which will maximize the number of zeros. So whenever you have larger number of zeros in the, this segment that you are going to store in the final bit vector, we're going to choose that. And then we move on. Now, we remove the search window over here, you will see that the number of zeros start to get less and less because they will break down into two segments. So zeros happening from this segment and another zero happening from that segment. And this is where we are going to not replace the things in the final bit vector because the number of zeros is going to be less than whatever we have in the final bit vector. And this is where we reduce the number of zeros and we have a few ones stored over there representing the ones we got from the, um, the, 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 the diagonal that has the largest number of zero. Again, these zeros not necessarily to be consecutive. And this is what we got in the final bit factor. And you can see the scalability here or the parallelism is very high. Why is that? Because searching, searching, not calculating the final bit vector, but also, but only searching the, the diagonals is all done in parallel. So you can have as many of these search windows all operating independently. And then each of them will give you a four bits or four cells as a result. And then only at this stage, you really need to synchronize the results. So you pick one and then the other one, try to overlap and see which one provide the largest number of zeros and then overtake that results and move on, carry over, right? So the problem um, solved by uh, dealing with the entire matrix, which can be really huge. Think about 1 million long sequence times 1 million long sequence over there. So this matrix can be huge. And then dividing it into four cells or a search window of width four, which is fixed size, that is perfect for FPGAs and hardware design. That is an ideal scenario where you can divide it into uh, only four uh, diagon uh, into diagonals of size four that are totally independent, although they are overlap. So you may have some uh, repeated computation for each search window, but still this core, let's call them processing cores or module, they are very small in size since only each diagonal has four bits. Plus you can repeat them many times because you need very low uh, resources. Uh, for the FPJ, a very low number of lookup table, for example. And then you can uh, have hundreds of them, thousands of them operating in parallel. Now that's all for the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And if you wonder about why we call it Chuji, this is a video we got from Suramichi, who was a researcher at our group. Uh, he was coming from Japan. And I visited him in Tokyo, uh, I think two years, three years back. And he sent me this video from his uh, grandmother house. So you can see, uh, observe the door now, how it opens. Yeah, so that is exactly the sliding window we have. And in Japan, they call this door as Shuji. So that's why we call the paper as Shuji. All right, now why we choose four? So we find that the right number should be three. To get the, the ties between two segments, this is always three, right? That is the minimum number of differences you can observe between two segments. Uh, because uh, there is a segment here, another segment over there, and you might get an edit operation over here, right? However, or if you detect only single difference or you're looking for single match between them, then um, you might include the random zeros. Remember, there are random zeros everywhere. So you might count them as correct matches because the search window is very short. It's four, right? Or three, if you want to consider it as three. So we said, let's include another bit either from right or left. That's an indication that um, uh, this might be part of very long segments of zeros. If we don't include this, then there is high probability or higher probability to have this as a part of random zeros. So by including one over there, only single one, is still less probability than having random zero, but it still can be the case, right? It still can be a random zero because we don't know the next. Uh, we can increase it to five, for example, 
but that uh, we observe that might lead to false negative. So we decide to have it four. As you can see here, this is only plot for false accept or false positive rate. And the false positive rate going to decrease as we increase the size until we reach five, start increasing false negative, uh, reducing, uh, providing false negative, then we decide, okay, let's stop at four. But of course, if you tweak the algorithm, you might be able to use uh, longer than four. Uh, if you, uh, rather than counting the number of zeros regarding if they are consecutive or not, then you might be able to come up with something else. We uh, implement this in FPGA again. Uh, the, as you can see, the resource utilization is higher than what we have before because we can, uh, we are able to process many of the problems or including more applications than the other designs since this is very scalable. We don't have any issue with the critical path. Now, we don't do actual counting. We don't really have count uh, because the problem with counters, each cycle you count, you count single bits, right? So you need to wait many cycles to count these. So we use lookup table since the size is fixed to four. And in the lookup table, you can simply enumerate all possible values and map them to the total number of zeros. So here, four, three, three, two, three, and so on. So that is very easy to get single cycle a calculation for all these um, counters instead of using real counters. So the the uh, the speed up we got is really huge, even using CPU implementation. And uh, compared to Gatekeeper and SSD, we still provide more accurate results, as you can see. But of course, this is not more accurate than Magnet. Uh, but still, the accuracy is really comparable than what we got in Magnet. The source code is available. I think the CPU code is also over there. If not, feel free to contact me. I can send it. I'm happy to send all these source codes. Um, yeah, this is the homework. So now you're giving Gatekeeper, Magnet, and Shuji. Can you summarize the time complexity, space complexity, FPGA resources, accuracy, and speed? Yeah, I need your help to solve this to summarize these four metrics and tell me based on this, which one is better, okay? Now this is an optional homework, up to you wanna solve it or not, but if you did, please send it over email and we will can discuss it. Hopefully by that, most speed up comes from parallelism enabled by novel architectures and algorithm. And as you can see in all existing work, we propose first a new algorithm, and then we choose the right hardware to accelerate that. These are another pointers, another lectures, and more research papers about the other topics. For the next week, we will continue with one more filter, and then we will move to totally new topics uh, from the group. Uh, I will ask some of my colleagues to jump in and explain some other topics for you. So we'll have more flavors uh, covered by genome analysis. So that's it for today. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to send it over email or uh, you can send it in, over YouTube. I can try my best to answer them also. All right, so it seems we don't have questions. Yeah, thank you so much for all the participation in the chat and take care. See you next week. Bye-bye.